So we're going we're gonna to have a chat about how Microsoft is using AI internally. And you and I have had several conversations about this over the past couple of weeks. So I think it's going to be fanta fantastic. And I'm going to start with an easy one here. So tell people what your responsibilities are at Microsoft. It sort of depends on the day. Okay. Um, so in customer success, uh, we're really focused on making sure that our customers get value from the products that they've uh, trusted uh, uh, Microsoft to provide for them. Uh, and so we spend a lot of time working through technical architecture, optimizing deployment in the cloud, and uh, optimizing security, optimizing spend uh, with, our, with our customers. Perfect. So we had a bunch of questions we talked about. I decided to just throw those out and make up new ones here, so I hope you don't mind. Um, so <laughs> we're going to start here. The, so you and I talked about the fact that, um, you know, being the fact that Microsoft is an AI provider, that you consider the customer success organization, organization there customer zero for Copilot. What, what does that mean? Like define... Well, I, fundamentally, if we expected that our customers were going to believe us when we talked about how much um, productivity they could gain from using AI or how they could transform a business process, uh, we felt like we kind of needed to prove it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so being customer zero meant deploying uh, our own technology within our own shop first so that we could prove uh, that the things that we were convinced were true uh, were actually being proved out mm -hmm. uh, in production. Well, give me, a, I'm just intellectually curious, give me a sense of, because I imagine there's new capabilities that are being beta tested before you, they put them out in the wild. So they, basically, are you the guinea pigs for, for some of that stuff? Or how does that work in terms of releases? Um, so in, internally, when, um, you know, when we talk about like the, the release to our people, we have a, a, like a pilot group of folks that tend to be on the cutting edge of so they're trying anything to do that we latest do. And greatest. There's an opportunity for them to you know, kind of get their hands dirty and give us feedback about the things that uh, really aren't yet production ready or aren't yep. yet you know, har hardened enough for them to deploy at scale. Yeah. Uh, and then from there, we, we kind of deploy to, to the masses. At Microsoft, we have about 40,000 uh, engineers and agents who provide customer support. So, oh, yeah. so that's a great non, test bed. Non-trivial group yeah. of folks. Yeah, great test bed. Okay. The, um, so let's, I want to talk about the rev gen side of it, like we were talking about this morning in AI. But let's start on the server side. What, what are some of the best use cases on the server side for AI? So the, I, I think the, the mistake that we see a lot of customers make is that they try to solve world hunger uh, out, of the, you know, out of the gate as opposed to picking off the low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. uh, if I look at the things that we use Copilot for broadly across our support organization, uh, it is not the life-altering, game-changing kind of stuff. Um, summarizing case notes. You, know, you work with a customer over the course of multiple hours, multiple days. You have multiple revisions of, hey, let's try this, let's try that as you're troubleshooting something. Being able to summarize that at the end of my shift or at the end of my interaction with the customer in the event that next time they call and they get you instead of me, yep. uh, gives you the opportunity to quickly come up to speed so that customer doesn't have to re-explain their entire problem. Mm -hmm. um, we hear from our engineers that they save on average about 30 minutes per case wow. for not having to go back and manually summarize everything because it's not just about entering the data, it's also about going back and refreshing their own memory mm -hmm. about all the things that they started from. Um, the other uh, big use case that, uh, that, that we think is, is really compelling and we hear a lot from our support engineers, but more importantly from our customers about, uh, is drafting communication, whether it's chat communication or email. Yep. Having generative AI take a, take a spin at that first. I don't know how many of you uh, have tried to draw empathy out of somebody who is a deeply technical support engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's not exactly yeah. where our customers yeah. would hope that it is. Yeah. Uh, and we have sort of trained the AI that generates emails, uh, updates to a customer or chat to a customer to be naturally more empathetic. So what does that prompt look like? Um, I want you to write this response to the customer in a way that the support engineer actually has a heart. Is it something like that? And then they <laughs> put that it's, in there? It's, it's not far off. So we have, you know, 400, wow. 400 million of you use uh, our Microsoft 365 suite. Copilot is part of that. Tell it to draft something with extreme empathy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you will get something that sounds like, dear Mr. Customer, I'm really sorry about this problem you're having. I'm sure that's been very difficult for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great start. Yep, yep. The, uh, I'm curious, be, because I see this within our own company, like you say, meeting note summaries, um, if you're researchers, um, getting comfortable with using AI to co-write with you and be an accelerator there. In terms of, of adoption, in the fact that you are a tool provider there, it, you know, any sort of lessons on how to, because you had said 40,000 people, yep. how do you make sure that 
that everybody's getting you know the awesome advantage as opposed to like well we've got these early adopters or maybe I have 40% of the people but you know how do you really drive because there are it does save so much time, it really does. Yeah, I mean, for all the customer success practitioners in the room, you know how important adoption services are in working with customers uh, on that change management, uh, you know, and that, that is no different for an internal deployment than it is when you're working yeah. with an external customer. Uh, we first had to start with, what's in it for me? Mm -hmm. uh, what's in it for you is that you don't have to spend a bunch of time summarizing cases manually or drafting all these emails manually, and uh, on the other side, you know, you'll, you'll get better, you know, better, better results. Um, also, uh, one of the things that's in it for our engineers, uh, again, I don't know if any of you have ever really opened up your knowledge base and looked at what's in there, but it's kind of a wasteland of years of, uh, of information in a lot of cases. Yeah. Putting a generative AI interface on front of your knowledge base is one of the things that lets our engineers much more quickly now find the things that are useful for them in the yeah. moment. Uh, without having to sift through a bunch of articles that, that don't make any sense and that yeah. makes their life easier. Yeah, that, I mean, obviously that is a killer use case. So the, um, but the main thing I wanted to talk about really was more on the RevGen side. And so, and as I was talking this morning, we know that, that, that sales organizations have been lagging on adoption. We know there's a lot of need there uh, that they've got to go after these use cases. What are some of the top use cases that you're pursuing at Microsoft as it relates to helping with revenue generation workflows? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, support is so much easier than sales uh, in terms of using yeah. uh, using AI. It's much more structured. It's much more linear. Uh, the processes are much well more defined, you know, better well defined. defined. Yeah. Uh, and also the metrics by which you measure, you know, uh, how long does it take to pick up a case? How long does it take to contact a customer? Super well uh, understood. Yep. Uh, and so when you think about targeting improvements, it's really easy. I mean, we've seen something like a 12% you know, reduction in the total time that it takes from the case being open to the case being closed using AI. Yeah. It, you don't really measure it in quite the same way in a sales interaction, mm -hmm. uh, and so it was just a little bit tougher. When we started looking at the places where really we were getting a lot of value from uh, using AI in our support organization, though, we realized inside sales mm -hmm. looks quite a bit like support, yeah, whereas better outside sales, processes, yeah, yeah much, much less so. Uh, and so really we're targeting the sort of those inside sellers as the first point of okay. entry for AI because they are much more structured the way that they work, the things they do yep. are a bit more linear and a bit uh, more metrics driven yep. in terms of how they measure the success. It's not just about did I close a big deal, it's also about how many phone calls that I make, yep. how many leads that I generate. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, so I have a working theory, and I'd be curious, it, you know, your perspective on it, and that is, because what you put on the table there is that one of the reasons that services, uh, you know, especially support, has leaned into AI more effectively is, like you said, the processes are very well defined, the, you know, the, the efficiency metrics are very well understood, and so you can take an AI capability, and apply it there, and go, wow, benefit. In sales, it's, it's just loosey and goosey, and it's not very data driven, and you know everything's an art project. You know every, it, it is what it is. My working theory here is that AI is going to drive both process and and data driven thinking into sales in a way that we've never seen in the history of tech. And so, you, and I, I love the fact you start like on the BDR side where there is more process, but I think that's going to eat through. You know, not everything in sales, but I, I'd be curious what you what your thought is there into where it's going to go? As someone who's, you know, spends most of my life thinking about customer success, one of the, uh, you know, one of the things that I find really interesting is that as it becomes more data driven, as it becomes, um, you know, more driven by, uh, you know, what, what, like what is really the next thing that I should position to this customer in a more formulaic way, but also something that's fast enough and dynamic enough to help me in real time while I'm in that conversation flow. Mm -hmm. um, Selling is gonna, in, in a lot of cases, look a lot like customer success yeah. looks today in terms of, well, what is the next best action that you should take? What is the next thing that I recommend? Yeah. Um, in a way that feels, I think, to a customer much more helpful yeah. than like selling. Yeah, well, and that brings up uh, it's, you know, a topic that we talked about in the executive advisory board around this blurring, in terms of account-facing roles, this blurring between, well, what's the difference between a CSM and a, and a sales e account executive and who's doing what because now with these tools and the type of ways they're interacting with the customer, you know, I think that there's going to be some rethinking of, of, of how those roles are done. The, um, so let me ask in terms of um, the tactics of deploying, you know, AI and, and, and what are some of the differences you're seeing between as you've deployed it in services 
and and now deploying it, let's say with the you know the salespeople, BDRs, et cetera. What are the differences there that people should be ready for? I mean, I think you know, to state the obvious, probably the biggest difference when you start touching outside sales is that these are people who are not sitting in front of a screen all day. Yeah. Uh, these are people who you know may not be able to easily incorporate AI into the conversation they're having with the customer you know, over coffee. It's it's going to be a little bit tougher than when you naturally sit behind a screen and AI yeah. is kind of your your co-pilot sitting yeah. right next to you. Uh, so I think you have to be ready for you know what are the what are the places in which the entire flow of someone's work doesn't have to change in order for AI to be a powerful mm -hmm. co-pilot or assistant mm -hmm. uh, versus where are the places where you really are looking fundamentally at a change in the way that someone works. Yeah. That's a much heavier lift. Yeah, yeah. The, um, well, I mean, you bring up a good point. I mean, in terms of those two audiences, the one audience is spending a majority of their time in it. if they're interacting with a the customer, they're doing it and there's a screen in front of them. Salesperson, a lot of opportunities when they're talking to the customer and that's not, not the case. But it's interesting, one of the things we talked about in the CRO Council Advisory Board meeting about this issue of adoption was the people that were having more success said, look, and it's what you are on with workflow. For the salespeople, if we want them to use AI, for example, to do a proposal creation or do RFP response, that's gotta be a button that is like right there in the workflow already, in their CRM, whatever. And it cannot be, oh, go over here and use this new thing over here. Cause the, you know, people's experiences, they're just not, going to do it is w you know what your ex experience with it well it, i mean at, at the risk of turning it into a microsoft product discussion we, we use dynamics for mm -hmm. our case management system not yeah. uh, not unexpectedly and copilot is integrated into dynamics in a way that as i'm looking at the screen of information yep. uh, there's a, a a side light that's bringing me ai insights about the customer about the case mm -hmm. you know suggested actions communication prompts those sorts of things so it is very much in the workflow, yeah. Um, and w you know, we, it, it's been really clear with our support folks that if it's not in their workflow, it's going to be much harder to drive their adoption. They're yeah. going to be much less likely because it's yeah. just not going to be in their face, yeah. reminding them that it's you know it's there and it's convenient. Yep. Yeah. So you know, this morning I I talked about these AI use cases in RevGen that are mature. They're below you know below the waterline. You can go do them right now. Um, and, and there's a lot that you can go chip on already. But I'm curious, let's think futures here. Mm. So w w what do you think are gonna be some of the killer use cases for AI in the future, um, in both services and in, in revenue generation? Look, I mean, I, I think right now, it, it is somewhat temporal, like right? what's, what's going on in the environment around you in terms of what's a killer use case. Right now, I think most of us are feeling cost pressure yeah. Um, and so when I think about the ability to continue to drive substantial growth without driving substantial growth in the expense line, mm -hmm. uh, right now the, mo you know, the most killer use case for our CFO is how can you drive the same growth rate that you drove last year or better at you know, yeah. half the cost growth that you had yeah. last year. Yeah. Uh, and so the use cases that, that we're really focusing on are those that you know, help accelerate that top line growth and the ones that really help with, with containment of cost mm -hmm. growth uh, along those lines. That's again, not, not the sexiest answer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it certainly, um, you know, certainly isn't the one that's gonna, you know, get everybody to like jump up and down. But I think it's the reality of where we are at the, you know, at the moment. And I think is, you know, as, as that changes, as the economy tends to, tends to do, um, what looks like a killer use case will change a lot. But right now it seems to be a, a lot of meat and potatoes fundamentals. Mm -hmm. um, but when I, you know, when I think about the future uh, with, you know, with our customers, we spend a lot of time, as I, as I know many of the customer success practitioners do here, uh, just working through how do you measure business value? And then how do we make sure that when you deploy our product, you achieve the value that you expected from that deployment? Uh, being able to use AI to both automate the, the sort of the capture of that information yep. up front, as well as being able to regularly check in on the progress against that, yep. I think will be pretty exciting for our customer success teams. Yep. Um, you know, support is never good enough. It's never fast enough. You never solve the issue quickly enough. Uh, so as I think about the, the support domain, um, there's a bunch of opportunity there. But one of the other ones that um, I was at a conference this weekend with, with one of the, uh, the largest uh, education providers uh, in the world, and they were talking about sort of how they're fundamentally changing the way that uh, students interact and engage with material using Gen AI. Um, and it started with the sort of early days of chat GPT. Please you know, please tell me the answer to this question that I'm trying to, to find the answer to so that I can write my book report or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, 
what they've done, you know, is, is a bunch of research on just spoon feeding the answer to someone with generative AI in the context of solving a support case or closing a deal in sales makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. But when you're a student, I'm not trying to teach you the answer. I'm trying to teach you the critical thinking skills yeah, right. to get to answers. Yeah. And so just spoon feeding you the answer is actually counter to the objective. So when you think about education, I want to teach you how to think through a problem. Mm -hmm. I, want to, I don't want to teach you the answer to the problem. Um, so the way that they're using Gen AI is, has been tuned to not give you the answer, but to help prompt you along the, the critical thought path. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think for education services, that's a really interesting use case. Use case. Yeah, for sure. So you put it, several things on the table there. I want to go all the way back to the, this meat and potatoes stuff. So, and JP was chipping on this a little bit this morning. This decoupling um, of the fact that our revenues are going up, and historically there was always this correlation between, oh, we have more revenue, then guess what? We obviously have to have more employees, whether it's salespeople selling to hit that number, or service people to deal with those, you know, more customers. And now there is this decoupling where the expectation is, I want to see revenue go up, but I want to see headcount flat or maybe a little bit down. And I, I tested that in, in both the executive advisory board meeting, we talked about it, and the CRO council, and just heads were shaking up and down going, that is the new math. That is the new math, which leads to what you're saying, these meat and potato use cases that may don't have to be super sexy, but if they, re if they represent significant labor savings, like m meeting notes and this and that and the other thing, and you can take 30 minutes here out of somebody's life and an hour here, and it allows you then to scale, um, I think that is probably the foreseeable future, right? That people wanna, wanna focus on that. Yep. And if you, uh, you know, if you look at the things that we all try to solve every day, we, you know, we, we all know that happy employees do a better job to making happy customers. Yep. So how do I improve my, improve my employee experience? Mm -hmm. How do I make you more productive? How do I remove some of the junk work that you don't like to yep. do from your life? Yeah. Um, has a, has a measurable effect on job satisfaction. Yeah. Um, so I may not need as many employees in the future, meaning I may not need to grow my headcount as much to support the revenue growth. Um, but if I can make those employees that I have twice as happy yeah. with the work that they do every day by removing a lot of the menial tasks, yeah. they're going to do a better job taking care of our customers. Yeah. It, 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 I had mentioned this morning this episode I had done with, with Brent Grimes from, um, from Reef. And one of the things that, that I think it was in that podcast, and it might have been in, in, a, in a conversation before, but y you know, he was saying, look, we are just making our employees do too much data entry grunt work just too much, and we've gotta be using the technology to take, and I think employees, whether they're support people or salespeople or whoever, would be so much happier if they were like, cut the amount of data entry I have to do, keeping this crap up to date by, you know, half or, or two thirds, I think it's gonna be a much better employee. Yeah, and one of, the, one of the things that we're, we're seeing now is sort of this transition from uh, co-pilot being a personal assistant to mm -hmm. Copilot being sort of a team assistant. Mm -hmm. So if you think about uh, Copilot sitting in on your team meetings week over week over week, they know what the agenda is, they know what the action items were. Being able to generate next week's agenda to follow up on the action yeah. items from the last meeting, those sort of administrative yeah, yeah. things that you have yeah. to do, yeah. typically falls to a, you know, a, a, an executive assistant or a business manager for a group kind of thing. Yeah. Um, if you can take those tasks and have AI do those for you, yeah. um, you, can, you, know, you can take away a lot of the sort of administrative minutia that people have to do yep. and then redeploy that time to more yeah. interesting work. Yeah, no, I don't think there's any doubt about it. The, um, back to this sales thing, though, I, I'd be curious your thoughts on this. The other thing I w we, were, we were testing in the CRO council dis discussion was this decoupling, right, of revenue and headcount. One of the things on the sales side of the house is that means that salespeople, the expectations from a revenue per rep, is, is, it's got to go up to make that math work, right? And, and so I think most people right now, the conversation they're in is they're saying, well, hey, you know, revenue's going up, your quota just went up, and you know, a sales leader says, well, hey, obviously I need more people, or the individual reps are saying, well, you know, my comp's gotta go up because my number just got bigger. And it's like, well, actually, no. <laughs> the comp plans are the same, the head count's the same, but the number is bigger. Do, do you see that conversation come working through the sales side? So I was just pulling up uh, this stat. I, I talked to our uh, inside sales folks before, uh, you know, before I came about what they're seeing sort of early days. Mm -hmm. um, so 
before they had any AI in the, you know, in the system, uh, they were on average qualifying one lead every 12 hours. Okay, wow, okay. They're now qualifying four leads in three hours. Wow. Work, right? So if you think about the qualification process, how yeah. quickly they're able to move through that, yeah. um, it, they don't have any more headcount. Like they didn't add any more people to be able yeah. to do that, but they're now able to qualify more leads. Our, you know, our problem is never that we don't have enough leads. It's that you know, looking at that entire they, universe right of unqualified leads. and yeah. turning them into qualified yeah. requires effort. And if we can streamline that process, right, we get to higher quality sales conversations faster. All right, so, that, so I got follow on questions there. So that's a dramatic improvement for sure, right? So from one, one to four, right? And, and so n number one, what is, are they, is it an AI model that is giving them feedback on the quality of that lead that's allowing them to work through it faster? Or just what's the, what's the mechanism that's allowing them to do it faster? It, it's a combination of better understanding of the customer and what they already own, mm -hmm. where they've had other interactions within uh, the company, whether they, you may, So they're getting all this summary and visibility from a model that's basically the same, boom, 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 boom. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, I don't have to go do all that homework myself and sort through that. Okay. But, it, but it's also a little bit of what is the conversation that you have with the customer around this particular motion. Yeah. Um, so if I'm driving sales play number seven, um, the way that we have that conversation uh, needs to change a bit based on the customer dynamic. Mm -hmm. Being able to generate that sort of script that you follow per customer based on their individual dynamics and the sales play yep. together with you know maybe a current promotion that's running. Right? It's, it's a much more targeted conversation to get okay. to a, yeah, I'd be interested. Okay. And then my second question then is, so I can imagine if, if I'm an employee and my productivity metrics are going up like crazy, right? And, and I don't, you know, the comp models on like a BDR might be, well, how many qualified leads did you get to a salesperson, right? And they're saying, hey man, I'm cranking out four times as much. You know, it's a per diem model, whatever, are there expectations that I, you know, that my comp should be going up with that? I mean, wh what have you seen there? Uh, since my CFO is not in the room, we can have a candid conversation <laughs> about my thoughts. <laughs> is your CFO like the, no. <laughs> Look, I, I feel, you know, I, I, I do feel like if, um, you know, if, if you think about the impact of an employee mm -hmm. and that impact is how you determine what is a fair amount of compensation, yeah. there's a valuable, you know, there, there's a valid discussion to be had over time of, listen, if my impact on revenue is double what it was last year, right. Right. that should be worth something. Yeah. Um, if on the employer side, for every dollar of revenue, I need 50% the headcount growth that I needed a year ago. Yeah. I've also got some room to make yeah. that true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting because, uh, again, on the sales side of the, the house, why I think there is going to be a lot of consternation over the next couple of years is it was not that long ago, and, and I'm talking just pre-2022, where as an industry, we were basically buying revenue. And what I mean by that is, if you look at the compensation plans, if you look at, you know, sort of how low some of the quotas were, all the SaaS companies, it was like, I just need new revenue and I just need to make it attractive. So I'm hiring salespeople. I've got, you know, really, you know, pretty nice comp plans here because I just want revenue. And it was unsustainable, obviously. And now that pendulum's come across the other side. And I think sales, anybody who has a quota, anybody who's compensated that way, it's, it's a double whammy because <laughs> these kind of low, you know, easy, low hanging fruit comp plans are gone and the expectations are actually getting ratcheted up. So I think this is going to be, you know, a couple of years of, you know, tough love on the, on the sales side. I don't know. I, you're curious what you're, you're looking across the industry. I, I, I think to some extent that's true. I think the other thing that we're going to quickly figure out is um, that folks who are leaders in adoption of AI in their workflow mm -hmm. and folks that are laggards, mm -hmm. you're going to start seeing the difference in performance and impact sure. that they're having. Yeah, for sure. Uh, which is going to drive us towards, uh, you know, a world where those who are able to drive the, the higher impact are ultimately going to benefit the higher rewards. Yeah. Um, it'll be interesting to see whether that's, you know, whether that sort of becomes the carrot leads or the stick leads. Yeah. But I, I do think you're, you're going to see that it, it will become pretty obvious that, uh, technical support engineer who's using AI to augment their, their work is able to solve more cases mm -hmm. more quickly with higher customer satisfaction. Yep. Sales reps who are using AI and the way that they drive leads or manage their, you know, their calendars and appointments and things are going to drive more customer interactions, therefore more at bats, likely yep. more, more hits. Yeah. Uh, you know, th th those are going to be the ones that you look at and say, let's work more like Thomas works because Thomas is getting better results. Yeah. 
I think I, I think I think that's going to be true, and I do think that em the employees on you know both the sales and service side, they're going to start figuring that out. They are going to see the the difference between y you know the, the folks that are leaning into the tools, they're getting you know better impact, um, and I think the care side of that again on the sales side is if I'm using these tools and I am able to take hit my quota more easily and blah blah blah, there's going to be a lot of incentive there. It, it is one of the reasons though that this next set of research journeys, the topic that I personally want to chip into is sort of a day in the life of an account executive y using AI. Like how is that different? How much of their time are they interacting with the tools? Where are their biggest personal use cases? Because I think sort of creating a profile there that people can start to look at and say that is the next generation of what a sales executive is doing, you know, that drives this type of success it would be helpful because I think there's still a lot of mystery, you know, in terms of, of, of what, what's working, what's not. I'm um, watching the clock here. The one, one question I did want to ask you for the audience is if, if you're somebody who's still maybe relatively new in this AI journey, and, and, and a lot of companies are, what advice would you give of, okay, you're gonna start deploying AI, you know, whether it's sales or services, what would be things you would encourage people to, to focus on or h how guidance you'd give? 10 years ago, we talked about analytics. Five years ago, we talked about machine learning. Now we're talking about generative AI. Mm -hmm. The foundation of all of those, though, fundamentally is your data. Mm -hmm. And if your data is not good, then the insights that you get are not going to be good either. Mm -hmm. um, and so the use cases to start with are the ones where you've got the best hygiene in your data. Uh, if you look at the Microsoft 365 suite, you know, Office, Teams, et cetera, uh, hands down, the highest adoption mm -hmm. is in Teams. And the reason is that a meeting summary relies on the contents of that meeting, which are all generated right there, right then and there. Mm -hmm. There's no old data that's stale or out of date or not of good hygiene uh, to deal with, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the data that you can use there is pure and good quality. And therefore you're able to get great insights about, hey, tell me what was happened in this meeting, what was discussed, what are the action items that came out of the meeting, right? And people are impressed with the results because they started with good data. Uh, find those places where your data hygiene is really good or the AI use case is working off of data that's generated sort of in real time. Mm -hmm. Again, a support interaction is a great example of a place where I'm it's working with data. you on a very specific issue right now in a moment in time and all of the data is self-contained in that support case. I don't need 10 years of your company history uh, in order to be able to solve that support case. So, so start with those things where you've got really pure, clean data. And the other uh, piece of advice I would have, you, you mentioned um, you're interested to see what happens with sellers who use AI. Mm -hmm. So our sales force, um, recently we did a survey with them and they said that about 70% of their time mm -hmm. is spent doing things that they view as largely administrative. Wow. Like 70, did you say 70%? 70. You think about RFP responses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah highly yeah. Yeah. You think about, uh, you know, so anyway, yeah. th those sorts of things. If you could attack 25% of that, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. you think about if I can recover 25% of 70%, that's a lot of seller, yeah. seller time yeah. that I can recover. So start with those places where you've got a really well-defined and quantifiable opportunity. Mm -hmm. Because if you just start with like, well, we'll deploy AI to a bunch of people and I'm sure it'll work out, mm -hmm. you're not likely to love the, yeah. you know, love the results. So like you've got to start with something where you've got a really clear opportunity to go attack and a pretty clear path with the right data to go to yeah. go attack it. Yeah. Perfect. Well, that is our time together. I appreciate uh, you know getting the chance to pick your your brain on this and um, spending time with us. And we've got some more t more killer speakers coming behind us. So, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>